This is going to be very interesting. Let's go ahead and give her our attention. All right. I am so excited. Thank you, Sam, Bill, Ed, Jeff, Jeremy, <laughs> uh, for putting this together. This is amazing. Um, and it's really fun because having done uh, the very first CLA Summit with Fabiola and Christy Hobbs, three women put that thing together the first time. Um, it was, it's so great to be here on the inaugural. And I think we only had, we had a smaller room for that first one. It's probably about 30, probably about 40 people or so. So, and our goal then was good enough to do it again. This is beyond good enough. So, um, uh, my team right now that I work with, they're all uh, jealous of me right now, but they're coming next year. All right. I work for National Instruments. I started, yes, I worked for National Instruments in 1989. Um, I actually was in college then and not five years old. Um, and I still work for National Instruments. I've left a couple times and come back a couple times. And what we're gonna do today is a little bit different. We're not gonna look at code, although I really should have gotten some uh, snapshots of code. Uh, when I do this for the GLA Summit, I'll grab some snapshots of code, because it is appropriate. Um, but we're gonna talk about creativity. And we're going to talk about um, getting our, uh, actually harnessing our creativity in a very structured format. Um, because we've all been in that spot, like, um, like Bill just mentioned, where we're staring at something and we're stuck. But before we do that, I need to do my, our giants are female. Um, so just FYI, um, I did read a book about Marie Curie um, when I was a kid and she inspired me and I never questioned being a female in science or engineering. But I'm going to add something else. Um, I really, the giant that really um, got me to where I am today um, is my dad and he passed away when I was 20. He was amazing. Um, he was a PhD in chemical engineering which he got at Yale and so of course he dies I'm 20. So of course my daughter's never met her papa. My daughter is now getting a PhD, I'm sorry PhD, a chemical engineering degree at the University of Tennessee, and my dad worked very closely with the chemical engineering department at the University of Tennessee. So there's a little bit of genes there that my daughter has picked up from my dad. Um, he has two patents, they were, and he got them in uh, 1968 when I was one. That was before um, they handed out patents like candy, so you actually had to put a little, uh, put a little information into there. Um, he was a world traveler, 1970s. He's traveling all over the world for trade shows and brought us home all cool stuff. Um, that's why you see him with snakes here, because he's somewhere in Malaysia in some lab, and um, he's not afraid of snakes. I'm not afraid of sharks when I'm diving. So I, I got a little bit, inherited his adventure. He drove a Jeep before it was cool, and he was awesome. And he, there was no question that he, when he knew that I was good at math and science, oh, here's a good one for you. Um, he wanted me to be an engineer. So this is, what my, this is how my dad helped me with my math homework. Hey dad, I got 50 questions here I gotta turn in. Can you check them and make sure that they're all correct? Because I was a perfectionist. So he checks all my questions. He's like, yeah, you got one wrong. <laughs> which one? <laughs> I had to go do all 50 because he would not tell me which one I got wrong. Um, and then the other fun thing with my dad, um, I, uh, I got my undergraduate degree, which is my only degree, um, at Rice University. It's a private school in Houston. And um, my first semester, grades weren't too good. And my dad um, had a little conversation with me. Those of you from Texas will appreciate this. He's like, well, if your grades don't come up, you're going to Texas A&M. And there was no way in hell I was going to Texas A&M. Right, Darren? <laughs> wait a minute, I thought, you're, wait, your daughter's at, Okay, that's all right, UT. Okay, good. <laughs> I was just making sure. So anyhow, um, Megan is here with her amazing dad. So Megan, raise your hand with your amazing dad. And then Hope is in the back with her amazing dad as well. So I think that's so cool that you ladies are here with your dads. All right, uh, quick notes on um, NI's new operating model and where I fit in and where I influence. So. If you're not aware of it, we have four business units now at NI. And um, there are, I don't know whether it's 100 people or 200 or 500, but there's a group of people here that focus in this space only. And a lot of people that we've hired from outside of NI. And they're trying to solve the biggest problems in this market. This group over here is trying to solve the biggest problems in that market. And so you have uh, industry leaders and you have engineers in this space here. And then we have product planning and product R&D. 
So this dude over here um, that's coming up after me, Mr. Ruffett, is product R&D, and we have product planning. These span across all of our BUs. And so what's, and then I'm in services, and then we have a few people, I think you saw earlier, that are in the support organization. But um, where's the comment? Where's the snarky comment? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm in services, um, and the reason this is green because uh, it's a services presentation that we gave to somebody else. What's great about this is we do have an opportunity to see a lot of interesting things going across the different BUs, and it really helps for collaboration and innovation. I love my job. I'm a solutions architect right now. I, I have a new manager who's fantastic. Our services group is reorganizing, so if there's anything services related, like our um, integration engineering, um, resident engineering, those types of things, that's where I live and I can support or influence or do whatever I need to do. Then um, our senior VP is Jim Ramsey and he's also in charge of the partner program. And so I know we have a lot of things that we'd like to do better there. And um, I'm not gonna defend the things that we have all been irritated about, but I have a lot of trust in him that over time we're going to see improvements here. But um, let me know your thoughts on that one. All right. One other thing, um, and this is where I'm looking for some creativity, uh, creative people. There is a product that we have released internally at NI, but we haven't fully productized it yet. And I have permission to sh show this slide. And this is going to be really interesting and fun, and I think it's really going to empower the LabVIEW community tremendously. So if you go to ni.com and download Instrument Studio, um, oh, is that what, why did it flip back? Um, oh, okay. That's why you're giving me the weird look. All right, there we go. I'm not sure why that happened. Um, okay, so note to everyone, if you have an iPad Pro, um, it's not exactly doing everything you would want it to do when you're presenting. So <laughs> uh, I should have done my PC, but it's a friendly audience. So anyhow. So Instrument Studio is a package of software that comes with your um, P NIPXI devices. It allows you to open up a software on panel for the instrument, press the buttons. Norm, what was your term? Happy fingers? Happy dance. Happy dance, yeah. The fingers doing the happy dance, pressing the buttons. And it also allows you to save a configuration when you're just looking at the software panel, then load it in the test stand, load the configuration so that you know when you're running test stand, you are running the exact configuration that you used in the soft front panel. And it's actually incredibly powerful. Um, and the other thing is we have released being able to do um, these soft front panels in G, so in LabVIEW. And so um, with one of my clients, um, they have a lot of third party um, GPIB instrumentation. They have their own box and another box and another box they can now create soft front panels in LabVIEW and it's going to empower them tremendously. So what I think we will have in the future, and I don't know what it looks like, is some kind of a community where um, people can make these soft front panels and you can either sell them. I don't know what all that looks like. I don't know how we're going to monetize it or anything. But if being involved and getting plugged in um, to the community at NI that's doing this and some of our customers, um, we're going to tentatively kick off a little bit of a mastermind kind of group um, so that as we're filling out this, um, we're also getting input from you guys. So just ask me, um, just grab me and ask me about that. Every single customer we've shown this to, they've been super excited. And that means any LabVIEW programmer can, you know, like if you go into a C-sharp team and you're a LabVIEW programmer and your team and that team has adopted this, you're fine. No problem at all. So I think it's really going to help our community. All right. Um, I, Nancy Henson, am a proud sponsor of GDevCon. Not NI, I'm part of NI, but I also sponsored. I sponsored because I taught LabVIEW in 1989, and I love this community, and I'm, I really wanted to support this event, and um, I really should flip. I'll, I'm, when you guys do the exercise, I'm going to switch to my laptop that is sitting back there. Um, and I started, a I started my side gig, and so my side gig is Henson Consulting, and it's corporate speaking. It's events like this. And so my side gig for fun is going to be um, speaking on creativity and engineering creativity on demand. And what really kicked it off was, um, like you guys, I was ready to divorce my entire family. I'm recently remarried, five years. We got five kids. Everyone was at the house over the holidays. And I found a great co-working space. 
And so through my friends at my co-working space, a lot of whom are speakers and have been on the TEDx stage before, uh, one of my friends says, Nancy, if you really want to do this, you should apply. And so I applied. I don't know how, but I got accepted. So um, TEDx Cherry Creek Women is December 4th, and there will be a, an 11 and a half minute version of this is going to be on the TEDx stage. And so I am not posting this video today until after that video drops, because they really want, when, when, it get, when it drops with TEDx, they want it to be original, and it will be original. But a lot of what I'm speaking there will happen here, and it's a subject I'm passionate about, and, um, and I need an extra career, because um, this is Princess, this is my camper, and I drove to Wisconsin to pick her up, pick her up um, when my kids were little and she is retro and she's so cute and we have had amazing camping experiences yeah don't use an ipad pro to present and now i am selling her to another mom who's going to go do amazing um, experiences and i want to afford this when i retire <laughs> so uh, a little bit of speaking on the side is going to help me uh, afford this so um so i'm excited about that and i'm excited about um everything going on at NI right now. I really have a fantastic team that I'm working with. Um, all right, so for starters, you guys have had a nice meal and you're not gonna go to sleep. And I w there's a reason why we're doing this and you'll catch the reason kind of towards the end. I want us to brainstorm for about 10 minutes, uh, seven to 10 minutes on these four topics. And what I have set up over here is you all have post-it notes in front of you. If you have already lost your GDEVCON pin, I have extra pins here that are not uh, privately labeled, and we have pins there too. And if you're over here, you're going here. Don't go to what you want to talk about. And so, Norm, you're not going back to the frameworks. You two are over here thinking about newbies. <laughs> So the four things, and I've been talking to a few of you, there are four challenges. Um, there have been ongoing challenges that I want you guys to brainstorm on. One is facilitating newbies into the LabVIEW um, world. So um, like Mark was mentioning, so Mark coaches um, FIRST Robotics, and getting those kids to kind of think and the data flow is difficult. Um, there might be a new engineer on a team that's all LabVIEW programmers and he's a Python guy saying, I'm just going to program in Python. You know, that's a, that's a difficult thing. You've got to market it and you've got to be able to onboard them quickly. How do we do this really, really well? And then on the G community, whether it's um, new Gers, prog G programmers, I don't know what this term needs to be. Um, maybe we can figure that out today. Um, you guys are going to be over number two in the back. Um, you guys are going to brainstorm on that. Just ideas and don't filter your ideas. Write them down and put them up there. Um, anything that comes to mind. Um, frameworks, that's the group in the back um, over there. You guys have your whiteboards over there. Uh, you guys are going to brainstorm on that. And then process. So this could be CI process or teams or anything. This is number four over here. So you guys, let's do this. You guys have until... 23 after the hour, um, you can write down where you're sitting and then go post it, but I want to see lots of yellow, st yellow sticky notes um, and ideas flowing. Yes, Alan. Okay, yeah, well, frameworks. Okay, so here's a problem with frameworks. How do I know what framework to use? What's good about my framework? What's bad about my framework? How do I know that I need to learn what Darren and Norm taught me today that I wouldn't have known otherwise? And what are those principles? How do I choose which framework? Yeah, and it, and it can also be, are there frameworks out there that haven't been created yet? Is there a framework, you know, anything, and this can include legacy code, but this is basically anything along, three is software architecture. So anything related to software architecture, I should have done that. And then four is anything processed. All right, sorry about that delay there, but um, fortunately, um, I have learned that 
Uh, don't expect your Lenovo to boot when you want it to, so you need someone like Eric here who booted it for me. Don't trust your iPad. Uh, eventually, I'll just be able to do it from this, maybe. Um, but fortunately, uh, I can, I've got this session down to my 12 minutes for the TEDx talk, so we're going to be fine for the next 25 minutes or so. So the two things we want to cover. One is we want to unpack what does it mean to engineer creativity on demand? What do I actually mean by that? Um, my husband keeps saying creative engineers. I'm like, no, no, that's not what it is, although it's for engineers. And then we're going to talk about the, the how. How do we actually do it? So we want to talk about what is this we're actually talking about today. Similar to what Bill said, where you, you've got something you've got to do. Now, everyone in this room knows you never start with a blank block diagram. But there's other things that we do that we start with something blank. And so we want to talk about um, what these three words basically mean. So from an engineering perspective, I just mean a process. So we all have different processes. They're repeatable um, and they're predictive. And so the idea behind engineering is just to have a process. And so this is going to be a process that you guys can use as soon as you leave the room because you're going to actually do that process today and over the next, uh, over the next I don't know, 24, 36 hours. So it's a process. Now let's talk about creativity. Um, so let me ask, a, ask you guys a question. Who is very competent in their creativity? That's a pretty good number of hands. There's about 10 of them. Okay. 10 to 11 hands. Confident in your creativity. All right, let's talk about what do we mean by uh, creative. So, David, when I say creativity, what are you thinking? I like to, I like to roll my own solutions. Roll your own solutions. Okay, you're a step ahead. <laughs> creativity. Um, oh, okay, I'm going to go through quick. I'll, I'll, okay, got it. Um, Casey or Sam, what do you guys think of when something I say... Something new. Huh? Something that doesn't exist. Something new. new. Okay. So tell, tell them to wait for the mic so everybody... Oh, yeah, wait for the mic. <laughs> But some of us, we think of art. So normally, we think of creative. The first thing that comes to mind is, you know, someone who's a good musician, someone who's a good artist, um, someone who's a good graphic designer, because I'm not. I had to pay my uh, girlfriend $50 to do my logo. Um, so does anybody know what this is, or where it is, or who did it? What's that? I couldn't quite hear that. but. Better in person. Yes, it's better in person. Michelangelo, and you don't see it by looking like this. You go into the Sistine Chapel, and you do this to see it. And I don't know how Michelangelo did it. But this is what we think. We think of art. Generally, that's kind of where our brains go to. You guys are ahead of me. <laughs> so what we want to think about a little bit more is that what does it mean to be creative? So um, for the CLA Summit in CERN, I took my husband, um, boyfriend at the time, two kids, and we drove all through the area. We ended up in Marinello, went to the Ferrari Museum. My uh, son loves cars. And so he painted um, this image of the P4. And so you think about it, this is art because he painted it, but the subject is art as well. And um, one of the books I reference is uh, Daniel Pink's book, and he talks in there, oops, I went too far. He talks in there about um, Bob Lutz, who has actually been a lead for all three car manufacturers um, in the US, so GM, Ford, and um, the other one, Chrysler. And he said, you know, you guys remember, well, wait a minute, some of you guys are young. Um, those of us who are uh, old enough to have programmed in LabVIEW 2.0, uh, we all remember the boxy cars, and no one wanted to buy them because they were ugly. And Bob Lutz says, and he's known for saying, um, as a car manufacturer, our business is art. And so this is, the uh, car itself was art. And I love this as well, because um, this is the mold for the original Macintosh case. I can't remember, where is Jobs? Jo Jobs is in the center, yeah, there he is. Okay, so this is Steve Jobs and his whole team. And um, really technology was their medium. Technology was their palette. And they signed this because they thought of themselves really as artists. And so when we think about creativity, and, and in this conversation as well, the reason so many of you guys answered David like you did is because you are an artist. 
what, when we first learn LabVIEW, it's all facts. It's how does that while loop work? Um, and then eventually you figure out a few things and it's like, okay, maybe I'll go try out that TLB thing. But you can see DQMH, TLB, Active Framework, everything is really more art in a lot of ways. And so as engineers, we are actually can't get by in our jobs without being creative. And so it's important for us, like in my day, I can't, I mean, I'm constantly having to do something creative because you do get to that point uh, where you become a PowerPoint junkie and or jockey, and that's kind of what you do, and um, you gotta be creative. So I still do a little bit of LabVIEW. So anyhow, we really wanna frame this as creativity is even more than that. And so um, this is the Daniel Pink book, A Whole New Mind, Why Right Brainers Will Rule the Future. And it's an interesting book in a lot of areas, but I really like this phrase in here because he highlights that synthesis. So, so it's combining those things into something new, exactly what Sam said. It's a synthesis of seeing a big picture, crossing boundaries, looking at a lot of different things, and being able to combine these disparate pieces into an arresting new whole. And I really love that. That's what I do in my day job um, as a solutions architect because I'll be working with an elevator company one day and then I'm looking, uh, working with a, a defense contractor the next day and I'm like, wow, this is, the this is actually the same problem. And then I'll see something else and connects these pieces. And um, so as a solutions architect, we will be hiring more. Um, so let me know if you're interested. I don't know when the recs are out. Um, I love it because I see so many different things and I'm able to connect the technology. Comments or questions? All right, now let me ask you the question again. How many of you are creative? How many of you are really, you really are creative. You saw what you're doing, you saw challenging problems. Sometimes it's with your kids. All right, so we've defined creativity. Now we wanna talk about on demand. I have some water here somewhere. I almost spilled it all over myself. All right, so we live in a non-demand culture. I have, um, I work in a co-working place, and right next door to the co-working place is the Jimmy John's. And when I get hungry, bam, number five with mayo, 10 minutes. And if they want a really good tip, make it eight minutes. So uh, that's fast, it's freaky fast. So that's one way of looking at all demand. Another way of looking at all demand is my children. They're teenagers. One's in college, like I mentioned, presumably adults. I'm surprised I haven't heard from one of them in the last <laughs> 20 minutes. Because, and you guys, you guys know it, you get it too. You get the text, mom, and then I don't reply for 35 seconds. Mom! 35 seconds later, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking to a director at some company. Mom! So for my kids, 35 seconds is what they call on demand. And if I haven't replied, then I'm in trouble. I mean, my daughter was calling me earlier in the back. I'm like, I'm in a meeting, sorry. I'll get to you later. So, 35 seconds. Um, I'm a football fan, college football. And Saturdays, oh, this last Saturday, oh, it was really good until it got really bad. Um, sometimes I've got three games going on at the same time. And if you wanna know what was bad, go find out what University of Tennessee uh, did with 54 seconds left in the game against Old Miss. Um, and sometimes it's bad when Texas A&M gets beat, or Alabama gets beat by um, Texas A&M, which I actually thought was good. But I am clicking between five games, three, usually at least two games, if not three games. And so as soon as I see that replay, I gotta click on demand. But that's actually not what we're gonna talk about here, on demand. Although creativity can happen instantaneously in certain situations, um, and we'll talk about that. But on demand here is deliberate. So not necessarily immediate, but deliberate. So I first gave parts of this presentation at the Berlin C uh, CLA Summit in 2016. I'll talk about that more. And I have gotten this down to a fine art where if I have a challenge, I know what kind of runway I need. So if I'm working on slides so that our VP can have a meeting with some director or somebody at that other company and, and me and somebody are putting those slides together, I need at least a week but I know that I will get those ideas through this process. No question about it. It's, it works every single time. And so this is deliberate, not necessarily immediate. All right, that was the what. So now we're gonna get to the how, and it's actually quite simple. 
And there's plenty of articles out there that kind of talk about it, but I wanted to really put something, all this together um, in an actual model in a way that I could remember it, I could share it, you guys can remember it and share it. Um, and so the model is input, incubate, ideate. Three I's. So this is how we're going to go through this. So we're going to go through each one of these steps, and then we're going to go through them again. And then I'm going to make sure that you guys remember this and never forget it. So first of all, we want to take a break and look at the brain and how the brain works. So this is the front of the brain. And when I am banging on my laptop, I'm using the executive function part of my brain. So that's the input. And I'm focusing. So the key word there really is focus. When I am focusing, I am putting raw thoughts into my head. When you guys are writing things down on the stickies, you're focusing. It, it feels like it's kind of output because you're writing stuff down, but the reality is when you are writing those things down, you are putting raw thoughts into your brain. So you're focusing. So you're in the input mode. You're using the executive function, prefrontal lobe. So when you are focusing, the neurons that are firing, they're all up in here. So that's the executive function. So generally speaking, there is another part of the brain, which is the daydreaming part of the brain. And this is the I'm going to walk a dog part of the brain. This is where your brain is, we're in the swimming pool. Or, you know, when we all go have a couple cocktails together after this. I am no longer focusing, for the most part. My mind is wandering. And so this is actually called the mind wandering um, state of your brain. The part of the brain that's doing all this stuff is the um, default uh, mode network, because this is the default mode of your brain. And it's a bunch of stuff that's not all necessarily here, but back here. So this is input, because we're gonna learn our hand signals. And this is incubate. You guys are gonna hate me. So input, incubate. So let me keep going through here a little bit. Um, so generally, you're gonna be in one or the other. And of course, you can be in a meeting or at GDEVCON, and you're focusing, focusing, focusing on what, what Norm and Darren say, and then you may actually just end up kind of daydreaming for a little bit. You know, sometimes some of us can't help it. Um, but it's generally two parts of the brain. So mind-wandering part of the brain, interestingly, and I've read about this in a couple cases and I, can, I can't remember the name of the researcher in British Columbia, do you think your brain is using more energy here when you're daydreaming or when you're in the executive function? You guys tell me. All right, who agrees with Norm? Your brain consumes more energy when you are in the input executive function phase up here. All right, everybody else over here, incubate, raise your hands. You won the contest. Um, and what you won was um, some Tootsie Rolls and um, the Starburst. That is the interesting part. Like, this is exhausting for us. Like, I typically try to work about a seven hour day before I take a break. By at hour seven, I am done. I'm exhausted. I go take a nap, and then I come back if I need to. I, I do get my eight hours in. But, and this feels relaxing. The reality is what's going on here is all those raw thoughts that you've been putting into your brain, either when you were doing research or something from two weeks ago or a month ago, all of the raw thoughts are connecting in the back of your brain. And so your brain is on fire with all those neurons firing and connecting. It is going to town. It's like your brain is doing your work for you. It's like, hey brain, I need a good idea. I have a, um, a leadership co uh, coach that I work with, and, she's, and I can't, there's a quote, and I can't remember who actually said it, but it's like, don't go to sleep without giving your subconscious something to work on. You know, consciously when you go to sleep, say, okay, here's the problem I'm working on, because your brain is also in the mind-wandering state when you sleep, so it's using more energy. And, um, and so let's go over these two. We've got, so we've got the input, put the raw thoughts in, and then we have our brain needs to incubate. How many of you get your greatest idea when you're in front of the laptop, when you're in the input state? Your best ideas ever, you're banging around. No, it doesn't happen that way. And here's the science behind it. 
So what happens then, let's come back to, so we've got the input. So there's input, I have to have the raw thoughts. So we've all heard that phrase, um, I had this great idea, out of the blue. But it's not out of the blue, it's through you. If I haven't focused on a topic and put the input in, I'm not gonna have a connection, I'm not gonna have that great idea. And I, uh, I help out with one of my girlfriends who runs a, um, a women's networking group and there's some things I want to do for her, and I haven't, I haven't had time to focus on it. And so I have no brilliant ideas. And so you have to spend the time focusing. You cannot get, you can't skirt it. So that's the input. But then in the incubate, it's when we're wandering, and then all of a sudden, those connections hit, and, and the, there's an idea, and you have that aha moment. So that idea of where those connections happened in the mind-wandering state all of a sudden pop into your consciousness. It's like, aha, I have that idea. Now, the other cool thing, when you actually have that idea, like we're going to all, you guys are going to be doing this all night tonight because you're going to be chit-chatting and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I had that idea. Um, I did my incubate. Is the nice thing about it, when you have that aha moment and you make a connection with it, you get a hit of dopamine. So for those of you that are in Colorado, that are going home to Texas, you can go back to Texas and you can get high legally for free <laughs> on all of your aha moments that you're going to have when you get back home. <laughs> With no harmful side effects, exactly. No paranoia, none of the icky stuff. So we have the input and then the incubate. Now the other key piece here, um, well I wanted to mention this as well. Um, Keith Sawyer, I really like his book. I'm going through it. I'm not all the way through it, but he is a creativity scientist. And this is the second revision of his book. But so incubate is actually a technical term that scientists use. And so that's not just something that I came up with. When I came up with my three eyes, I started with incubate. And then, of course, input made sense. And so here's the funny part. So we have incubate, ideate. I'm sorry, input, incubate, ideate. And before I had come up with the ID8, I had the first two. I had input and I had, um, and I had the uh, incubate. And, and I was sitting there, I was like, what's another I word? And I'm sitting there focusing on it. I'm being Boise, chilling for a mommy week. And I was like, what? I need an I word that, that is for the, and I could not come up with it until I slammed my book shut, um, had a sip of my margarita. I was like, oh my gosh, ID8. <laughs> So I literally, uh, that was a perfect example of I had to stop this part of my brain and go to um, the incubate to get my idea. But I like that he reminds us the best ideas emerge from this unguided, unconscious process that creativity uh, researchers call incubation. So I have three steps that we're talking about. He's got like 12. So he even breaks things down into uh, more granularity if that's something you're interested in. 10 minutes, five minutes. We're almost there, thank you. Oh, actually I have seven minutes, six minutes. Um, so ID8, so when the idea happens, how many of you guys actually remember your ideas? Like I had this great idea three weeks ago, and I, and I was like, it's only one idea, I can remember this. I still don't know what it is. What are you laughing about over there? Hand him the mic. all the time. Yeah, if you have kids, you can only remember one thing, if that. Write it down. And like, e take your sticky notepad with you if you want, and as you're coming up with ideas that you're going to put around here, definitely write it down. Um, you can put it on your phone. Um, if you're a swimmer, you can go to a dive shop, and you can actually get um, a little thing that you can write on with a pencil that works in water from the dive shop. <laughs> My husband and I dive. There are certain things I want to tell him without giving him the appropriate hand motion and getting in trouble with everybody. <laughs> yes. Um, so anyhow, oh, um, so Einstein gets his best ideas um, while shaving. He's known for saying that. And he, um, so he's getting his best ideas while shaving. So if you're like Einstein and you need to write down somewhere, you're in the bathroom, you're in the shower, go steal your kids' tub crayons. They work great on the windows or in the shower. Make sure you capture it. So input, incubate, ideate. So we're going to go back over these one more time with another way to make sure we remember this. How many of you guys know this phrase, eat the frog? I'm always surprised how few people actually are familiar with the phrase, eat the frog. 
So Brian Tracy came out with this. It's a part of um, uh, what he teaches on avoiding procrastination. There's a lot of really good stuff in here besides eating a frog. But the premise is, in order to not procrastinate, find that most difficult task that you don't want to do, put it in your, on your to-do list, put it on your to-do list for 8 a.m. or wherever you get to work, and you focus on that thing, you get the frog thing done, you eat the frog, do the most difficult task you have to focus on first thing in the day, and then the rest of your day you're productive. That's great for um, dealing with procrastination and being super productive. So I'm going to give us another piece of advice related to incubate. So what I want you to put in your day timer, in your plan or your to-do list, eat, I'm sorry, dance with the frog. So think about it. For those of you that have been at NI week and we're getting a little crazy, <coughs> Mark Bala <coughs> on the dance floor. Um, so when we're dancing, are we focusing on anything, especially if we're dancing with a frog? No, we're not focusing on anything at all. So figure out what your dance with the frog thing is. For my girlfriend, it's walking the dog. For my travel friend, it's swimming. Um, for me, it's going for a walk in, my ba um, in the open space behind my house. Figure out what your dance with the frog is. Put it in your to on your to-do list. And I do this regularly now. When I know I'm going to have a brainstorming meeting, I schedule dance with the frog afterwards. I make sure I go for the walk after that meeting, so that's when I'm probably going to have a really good idea. And I make sure that this thing doesn't leave for the most part, because um, the ideas are going to happen all kinds of times. But be intentional. If you're intentional on, on scheduling, I'm going to do this at this time, I'm going to just walk away from my problem, walk away from input, you will get those ideas. And sometimes it's things that take time, to think about. Like for me, I love to cook, and so I'm always inputting, and I have complete confidence that by the time I get up from my desk and drive home, I will have that idea of what I'm going to make for dinner every single time. And what I've also found is that usually, no matter what I'm working on, some of this can be really, really fast. I get out of my desk, or get away from my desk, get out of my chair, walk down the hall. Before I filled up my coffee, something pops. And so some things, I get those ideas super fast, other things, report for directors and VPs to have conversations, that I need a longer runway for. All right, so this is how we're, we're going to remember this. We've got Dance with the Frog. So you're not going to forget Dance with the Frog. I want to mention two things, and then we're going to close out, and I will be 20 seconds over. Um, when I gave this before, um, so this is on the ID8 side. When I gave this before, um, I gave this with the title, The Courage to Create in the Context of Community. So the premise behind TED Talks and TEDx Talks is ideas worth sharing. D you don't want to hoard your ideas, not helping anybody else. And so you want to share those ideas um, and have that courage to do it. And it's even more important than that is that, and I love Rollo May, um, he wrote in the 70s, he was a psychotherapist. All of his books are still relevant today, fantastic reading. He says, if you don't express your own original ideas, if you do not listen to your own being, you will have betrayed yourself. This is part of our humanity. It's part of our being. When we come up with these ideas, to share those and have the courage to share those. So, I'm gonna make sure you guys remember this. Stand up, please. You guys thought you were gonna get away from this. All right, so this is input. Everybody got input? Incubate, ideate. Norm, come up here. You're going to help me with this. <laughs> Norm, you know the chicken dance. Yes. Can you do the chicken dance for us real quick? Da 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 And we're gonna go faster. Da 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 da
So it's not today that you got your best ideas out here for solving these challenges. It is going to be later. It is going to be when you're shaving, for those of you that still shave. Um, and it's going to be when you're just walking around. R write it down, add to these throughout the conference. Um, and it'll be fun to see what happens. Um, here's how you can contact me. I'm always at NI. This is my new um, Nancy Henson, and that stands for Create, Create On Demand. Thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> <laughs>